Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. The theme for today's video is the haunted houses. Does your local area has any legends about cursed homes? Uh, we have a famous ghost town here, though not for supernatural reasons. It was poorly located, disconnected from villages and shops, making life very inconvenient. So no one bought the houses or lived there, and the whole luxury villa complex was eventually abandoned. But the three haunted houses we'll be covering today are the real deal. True paranormal activities have happened in them, from mild cases of tenants being scared to the ultimate loss of life. Once again, everything featured today is from the true experiences. If you're faint of heart, please view with discretion. Okay, the first story happened in Henan province. When I arrived in Zhengzhou for a job, I was living in the village in the city. The house I rented that kind of tube-shaped apartment building. They've got a courtyard in the middle surrounded by rooms on each floor, something like the apartment nowadays. The units were tiny, maybe 20 square meters at most. The kitchen and toilet were so small you could barely fit one person in there. My room was on the very top floor, right by the stairwell entrance. When I first checked out the police, there was another room available on the fourth floor too, but it was more expensive so I decided to pick the cheap one. At that time, the landlord hesitated and said it could get cold up there. But I thought, what room doesn't get cold in the winter? No heating, no AC, they're all the same. And when I decided to take it, the landlord also added, Oh, by the way, the room across from yours is occupied. But I didn't think anything of it then. Looking back, I guess he was trying to give me a hint. Nothing seemed off at first. I'd hear some noises from time to time. The neighbors opening and closing their door, faint voices, sounded like a man and a woman, but not a married couple. With those thin walls, I could make out them arguing sometimes, the woman yelling at the guy to let him divorce with his wife. Other times she'd bang the door and run out crying, and I could hear her stomp up the stairs to the top floor. As I said, my room was right by the stairway, so her footsteps always startled me, even though it usually happened when I was in deep sleep. But I could never tell if this was real or if I was dreaming. I also wondered why did these two never appear during the day. One day I was off work and lazing around the apartment. Around 10 p.m. I got hungry and decided to go out to eat. Though it had been raining all day, the night fair in those urban village areas are lively. Plenty of people still milling about at that hour. I got dressed and opened my door. Suddenly, a figure darted into the unit across from me, scared me half to death. The courtyard was pitch black. The hall lights were out too. I shined my phone flashlight but couldn't make out much besides what looked like a woman with long hair going to the opposite room. I went downstairs and noticed the family was holding a funeral, and they invited a group of opera singers to perform. Just experienced the horrible shadow, such creepy atmosphere made me walk faster to leave. So I entered a little restaurant at Hazard and ordered some noodles. Just as I started eating, I overheard the women at the next table talking. If I remember correctly, that couple once lived in Mr. Doe's house had died for a year, right? Mr. Doe? That was my landlord's name. And just then I recognized these ladies were also owner of the house, who got along well with our landlord. Then another lady asked, Has he rented out that unit yet? No way, who dare live there? But the opposite room has rented out. Speaking of which, that girl is very brave to live there, maybe just because it's cheap. Well, if you don't know, you aren't scared. Who knows what kind of neighbor she's got over there. And hearing this, I was nearly choked on my noodles. Were they talking about me? I couldn't help but go over and ask them directly. They recognized me right away, and their expressions froze instantly. Without saying a word, the two women quickly left. I lost my appetite. My mind raced with what they had said. That couple has died for a year? Which means the unit is empty now? Then what were all those voices I heard at night? The arguments, the footsteps, where did it all come from? Finally, I decided to ask my landlord what was going on. His room was on the second floor, but no one answered when I knocked. Freaked out with nowhere to go, I reluctantly climbed back to my sixth floor room. Before entering, I especially shined my phone flashlight on the door across from mine. It was locked. Under all kinds of fear, I rushed into the room and locked the door tightly. Exhaustion finally overcame my fear and I fell into an uneasy sleep. Same as usual, I was jolted awake by the sound of furious shouting from the opposite room. It sounded raging than ever, then a loud crash woke me up completely. 
But wait, I never heard the door open, and it was locked when I came home. I tiptoed to my door and peeked out. Still pitch black outside. Debating whether to open the door, the sound of a door banging made me jump. From the darkness, I saw a shadowy figure emerged from the opposite room. Some light spilled from a window down the hall. I could just make out it was a woman with long hair, holding something in her hand. It was a long, sharp knife. Stomp, stomp, stomp. She ran up the stairs to the top floor. Midnight, a dead couple, the black shadow, and a woman rushed up carrying a knife. After arguing with someone in an empty room, I was scared stiff. I crawled back into the bed and called the landlord with shaking hands. To my surprise, he didn't sound shocked at all when I told him what happened. Yawning, he casually said, "Oh, don't worry about it, dear. Just go back to sleep. I'll explain it in the morning." Then he hung up, leaving me with a feeling of mixture. Of course, I didn't sleep a wink that night. The first thing in the morning, the landlord came and told me the whole story. There once lived a couple, but they were just lovers and each had their own family. So they rented the opposite room to secretly meet up. Gradually, the woman wanted to be with him forever, so she divorced and waited for the man. But the man refused. So they constantly fought and made up over and over again. One day, a bad fight led the woman to stab and kill the man. After which, she jumped off the building and committed suicide. And what I witnessed were just their spirits reenacting past events. Previous tenants had seen things too, and they all moved out. And only then did I notice almost half the rooms on this floor were empty, and the occupied ones were all far from the stairs. All the tenants were afraid and moved out, and I'm not the exception. The landlord returned my deposit, and I quickly found a new room. As I left, he casually remarked, "Actually, you don't need to worry. They don't hurt people." I never found out if anyone else dared to move in after me. A few days ago, I passed by there and found the whole area had been demolished for redevelopment. Then no one will witness that ghostly flashback again. The next story is the one I have mentioned in the last video. If stories can be rated, I'll give it a nightmare. I'm writing this in my new house, feeling more at peace. But every time I think back to those days, my deep horror could still make me feel desperate and collapsed. It all started when I found an apartment in Shanghai. At that time, I rented a house in an insanely cheap price. It was a small one-bedroom, freshly renovated. But as soon as I walked in, it felt strangely cramped, despite being a good size. And even though it was summer, there was chilly inside, gave me the creeps. The whole vibe of the unit felt off. Oppressive, like I wasn't alone even when I was. And the landlord said it was brand new. In general, new houses should not have any stories. So I figured I was just tired and imagining things. Plus, the rent was so cheap, and it was really close to my office. And finally, I paid the deposit. If only I knew this was the start of my nightmare. When my friend helped me move in that weekend, my dog refused to even go inside, just barking madly in the hallway. I was afraid he'd disturb the neighbors, so I dragged him into the apartment. But this time, as soon as we got in, he hid under the bed. I guessed maybe my dog was just anxious in the new environment. I didn't end up staying the first night. Had to go back to my old place and clean it so I could get my deposit back. However, when I came over the next afternoon, my key wouldn't open the door. The neighbor lady came out and asked if I had bought this unit. I said no. I just rented it. She replied, "Oh, okay then." But how did you sleep last night? The dog barked the whole night after all. I apologized right away and promised this wouldn't happen again. At the same time, the door was open and I finally got in and got stunned. The place was a complete mess. All my neatly organized stuff had been thrown around. The vacuum was busted open on the floor. My computer screen was inexplicably smashed in half. The chairs were tipped over and the keyboard keys scattered all over. At first, I thought maybe my dog had done it. I dragged him out from the bed and brought him out. But the more I thought about it, the more wrong it seemed. My dog knows how important my computer is, and it wouldn't damage it like that. And it couldn't even reach the desktop to knock the monitor off. This had to have been done by a person who broke in just to wreck my computer. Still, I convinced myself it must have been the dog. But things only got weirder. I constantly felt like I was being watched in the apartment, even though there was no one. Just an uneasy, skin-crawling sensation of ice on me. But this was not the only strange thing. There was also a huge baby crib in the bedroom beside my bed. 
It was higher than my own bed. Every time I lay down, the pressure it gave me made me sleep and toss and turn. For many times, when I opened my eyes, the baby crib just stood in the darkness. The sheer canopy would cast weird shadows at night that looked like a person standing there, and I hear it creak and rock on its own, like the winding of an old clock. After a few nights, the crib's metal latches suddenly popped open, made me jolted awake. Originally, I had planned to remake it to a dog bed, but finding it looming over me and left me inexplicably terrified, I just had to get it out of there. I listed it for free on a local sale site. People thought I might be scamming them since it looked brand new and high end, but I didn't care. I just needed it out of my room. Even with it gone, I could never relax in that apartment. Sometimes the front door could open even there was no wind, and when I was busy in the kitchen, the water bottle on the living room table suddenly fell over by itself, and many of my belongings getting mysteriously knocked off to the floor. I'd come home and just feel this oppressive, heavy air. So I set up a camera in the living room, partly to see if someone was breaking in, and partly so I could check on my pets while at work. But the camera is what first made me terrified. One night, I thought I heard knocking at my door. I got up to check, but the hallway was empty. I called out, "Hello," but got no reply. Just as I got back to bed, the knocking started up again. This time, I went to the living room and asked, "Who's there?" But the sound suddenly came from right behind me. I whirled around, heart racing at the pitch black room. I felt this awful chill run down my spine. Someone was in here. I flicked on the lights, then retreated to my bed. I shone a flashlight under the bed where my dog was curled up, refusing to come out. I could never fall asleep, sat awake swiping TikTok. At this time, my phone started alerting me to motion on the camera, saying someone had broken in my house. The alerting vibration was more and more frequent, and my heart was pounding out of my chest. But my first thought was, there was a thief breaking in, which is more dangerous than ghosts. Just when I was ready to call the police, I checked in the camera. But saw the scene I would never forget in my whole life. The green box kept flashing in the dark. There were so many people in my house. At the same time, the alert still went on for motion, but there was nothing in the living room. Watching the green box flashing on and on, I was on the verge of breakdown. I cut off the camera, turned all the lights on, but still felt that creeping terror, worrying the lights would be all off in a sudden. I called a colleague and told him what happened. He said it was probably just a technical glitch, but I was too rattled. Then I begged of him to chat with me so that I could get some relaxation. We ended up talking until he got tired and told me to just come crash at his place. I immediately threw something in a bag and grabbed the first taxi over at 1 a.m. And in this way, I continued working at day and rushed home to feed my pets after work. The cat was hiding on the balcony and refusing to come back to home, and the dog also refused to come back home after walking. So I had to carry him in and hurry over to my coworker's house to sleep. And doing that for a week, my colleague kept comforting me not to think too much. So reluctantly, I came back to the house. Walking down the hallway, my skin would crawl. I decided sleeping with the lights on, and nothing happened for a few days. I tried convincing myself I was indeed imagining things. Maybe it was all in my head. But then I started having episodes of sleep paralysis at midnight. I jerked awake, unable to move or scream. I struggled to wake up and hearing the sound of knocking door. And at the same time, I could sense something moving in the room, but I could never spot it. Gradually, my mental state deteriorated. While washing up, I'd seen a flickering figure in the mirror behind me that was staring at me. But when I spun around, it vanished. For some reason, the bathroom had an abnormally low ceiling with a gap between it and the actual roof. I genuinely couldn't understand. My head practically touched it, and I had to stoop to enter. Under such narrow space, I always felt pressure and urgently to get out. And knocking sounds would come from that cavity at midnight, like someone banging its head on the floor above. The light fixture would malfunction no matter how many times I fixed it. And lying in bed, I could hear all those. Thumping noises. I couldn't stand it and play music loud to try to cover it. During the day when I was home, I got so unnerved that I took the ceiling light fixture down to check what could be making the noise. But the gap was completely empty. Apart from the light, the electrical kept randomly tripping too, forcing me to go to the hallway utility closet to flip the switch. Those sudden blackouts left me terrified, especially when I was in bathroom. In the dark, I could feel something watching me from that ceiling cavity. 
I kept expecting hands to reach down and yank me up by the neck, and I started avoiding being home as much as possible, working late and getting back home after midnight before passing out exhausted. And only at the office could I focus on and not obsessed with every sound. But I still dreaded that bathroom, especially the mirror. I could barely recognize myself in the mirror anymore. I started thinking the person in it wasn't me. It was just mimicking me somehow. Sometimes I even glimpsed the reflection was smiling at me. Then I started washing up in the kitchen sink, trying to avoid the mirror in the bathroom as much as I could. Ever since moved in, my hair was falling out in clumps all over the sink. I even doubted if these are all mine. And days later, my cat started acting crazy too. She wouldn't come out from the balcony and just yelled and scratched at the door all night. She was a neutered Siamese cat, which is famous for docility. I'd never seen her be aggressive before, and she'd hiss and swipe if I tried to calm her down. Looked like she was escaping something desperately. The next day, the cat was limp and lethargic, lying on the bed. I noticed one of her limbs looked injured and took her to the vet. Hundreds of dollars later, she was diagnosed with a broken leg that needed surgery and pins. I couldn't understand how a perfectly healthy cat could break her leg overnight, or something had broken her legs. And meanwhile, it felt like a black cloud had descended onto my own life as well. For several times, I was almost getting hit by cars. My reflection grew dull. I'd find myself standing zombie-like in front of an oncoming vehicle, unable to move away. Only the blaring horn would snap me back to reality, so I could dive out of the way. As soon as I got home, all I could do was sleeping. To avoid the approach to the bathroom, I even stopped using the toilet. Nor would I take a bath or brush my teeth at night. Even though I slept nine hours a day, I still felt dizzy and sleepy. At this time, my mental was very terrible. I always appeared black and blue for no reason. The feet are the worst. They got swollen and they stung heavily when I take a step. One disaster after another. I twisted the ankle on the stairs. I stumbled come to the office. The paper edge cut my fingers. The glass cracked. The slippery floor made me fall, and my eyes got stained. The colleague advised me to see the doctor. The pain, the rent, and medical bill for my cat. There was no penny left on me. I started to have badly body odor and felt mentally foggy all the time. I became afraid of mirrors. Our office lobby had a lot of glass, and I would deliberately avoid watching them. Then the nightmare came next: zombies chasing me, monsters lurking around corners. I was always running and hiding, but being caught. Then a little boy appeared in my dream. He would sit on my chest, choking me, and no matter how hard I thrashed, I was paralyzed. I tried to scream, but nothing came out until finally I'd wake up shrieking. And finally, I broke down and told my family. I wanted to tell them there was something horrible in my house, and I wanted to move out, but I didn't, for I was afraid they would be worried about me. However, the moment the call came through, my tears ran down controllably. I cried and yelled, telling them I was so scared, and my parents were all startled by my behavior. And mom said she would transfer some money to me so I could live in the hotel or just through a lease. Besides, she also sent me a pitchful sword to help drive away evil spirits. Those nights at the hotel were the best sleep I'd gotten in months. The hot showers, soft bed, and the relaxed atmosphere all left me centered again. And soon my mental got better, and everything seemed got back to normal again. The only pity thing was my pets were not allowed in the hotel, so I had to take care of them while after work. The pitchful sword arrived. Along with it were seven pitchful twigs. Mom told me to hand the sword over my bed with the blade tip pointing outwards. I checked out the hotel and came back home again. Maybe these weapons gave me psychological power. I didn't feel the unusual wave of dread. I boldly went to the bathroom. Nothing wrong. Then I hung the sword and twigs by my bed. I was determined to sleep through the night this time. I turned on all the lights and went to sleep. And I made it. Nothing horrible happened. Again, I really had imagined everything after all. My coworkers joked that I was being paranoid and psyching myself out over nothing, and they were probably right. I thought. At the same time, I noticed the cat took particular interest in the pitchful twigs. She kept trying to destroy them. For several times, I'd come home and find them scattered across the floor. Then there were only two twigs hanging by the bed. Finally, he tried to destroy the sword, but fixed by cord, 
He couldn't move a bit. But one day, the sword was gone. The cord got beaten through. I searched everywhere, but it seemed like it disappeared into the thin air. And then I got into the panic again. Needless to say, I was in a restless sleep. And at midnight, I felt something creeping out from the corner. And the knock, it came again. Then came the sleep paralysis again. I felt an immense pressure on my chest and couldn't move or scream. On my body, there sat a little boy. I couldn't saw his face, but I can hear him laughing wildly while he yanked out all my teeth. He got all my teeth ripped off. Then he took the sword and stabbed it into my gums, one after another, as if punishing me for hanging it there. My mouth was filled with blood. Then he pressed them all in my mouth, and the swords pierced through my throat. Right as I felt I was choking, I finally screamed myself awake, drenched in sweat and trembling. I couldn't fall back asleep, so I just turned on all the lights and waited for the sunrise. And of course, the knocking started up once more. I didn't care what it took. I determined to break this lease. Before I found a new apartment, I moved out and lived with my colleague again. And my parents also mailed me some new twigs and swords. In the colleague's home, I still dreamed the boy, but he was chasing after me with a sword. I was trying to hide. However, no matter where I hide, he could always find me out and stab the sword on me. The sword gathered more and more, and I couldn't put up with the pain and woke up with a scream. That scared the colleague. He said I was groaning on the bed. He gave me some sleep pill, which helped me make it through the night. The same day when I picked up the keys to my new apartment, I went with my coworker one last time to grab my things. The coworkers also said he felt crowded just when entering this house. Coincidentally, he also felt the pressure, and someone was staring at him behind the back, which made him dare not to close the door while in the bathroom. We found the mango peach wood sword in the corner of the balcony, and recognizable from being chewed and scratched by my pets. This was my true experience. I never want to know what exactly was in that unit, and I'm just grateful I escaped physically unharmed. The next story is chilling but interesting. The narrator calls it a three-year curse. As an interior designer, I came across many houses. For many times, my friends asked me if there is a real haunted house. I'd share with them this story. Now the full story hasn't settled yet, but let me give you a gist of what happened. So back in 2011, I was just starting out at this design firm in my hometown. I was mainly just assisting the veteran designers, doing all the trivials like site service, picking materials, stuff like that. Soon I got along well with everyone there and became part of the younger crew. One day in early August, around 1 or 2 p.m., a client came in. I snuck a peek. An elegant woman in her early 30s, professional haircut and clothes, but she seemed really unsatisfied and confused. We picked up our ears and unexpectedly heard such creepy stories. Long before she lived with her three-year-old son and six-year-old daughter in an apartment not far from downtown. She had just moved in that year and hired our company to renovate this house before moving in. And from the way she talked, she seemed pretty well off. Just paid the basic rental for twenty thousand dollars with ease, which is a lot for a second tier city. They lived in here for a year peacefully, but after Qingming Festival, weird stuff started happening. Small things would go missing: phone straps, hair ties, batteries. She didn't think much of it at first. Figured just the kids misplaced it. But they said they hadn't seen any of the missing items. Then here came the stranger things. The wallpaper in the kitchen started peeling off, and it was not like damping off. Instead, it went evenly toward the living room, like something had shredded it with force. Also, her son said he kept hearing footsteps in his room during the day. Flip flop sounds pacing around. At first, she thought it was from the upstairs neighbors, but she noticed the sound only came from her son's bedroom. When she asked her son, the little boy was too young to explain it. Sometimes said there was somebody, and sometimes not. That's when she started feeling uneasy. So she went to a well-known psychic at the local temple and invited him to inspect the place. The psychic said there were some evil things indeed, and in the house there only lived a woman and two kids. The kids are weak in mental aura, and she is a woman, which is too young to subdue the evil. That's why these occurrences kept happening, and the thing was able to roaming around unseen. But his motives weren't clear. 
He took tens of dollars from her and had her invite a Buddha statue from a nearby temple to place by the front door. But it was a statue that made things more horrible. At first, either because of the placeable effect or her heightened awareness, the noises and occurrences stopped after the psychic left. She thought this expensive ritual had done the sick. Things were peaceful for a few days, but one day, around Children's Day, everything started up again all at once. First, the faucet in the kitchen would loosen itself and drip even when fully turned off, and the circuit breaker would trip overnight. Then things got controllously. When playing, her kids broke the Buddha statue. The day after, she immediately went back to the psychic. But the psychic said the breakage was no accident. The Buddha failed to contain the evil, and it would be in vain to invite another one. The psychic told her to make a bead curtains with copper beads and tortoise shells, and install it in the baby room to alleviate the situation. Same as before, nothing happened in several days. But on the third day, it came again. First, her son got low fever, a low grade fever that persisted and could not calm down. Then the daughter got mumps and couldn't speak. Finally, she got sunstroke and cannot even walk. She couldn't stand it anymore and called her brother-in-law to take care of the children. And her sister came home to accompany her. The next morning, she visited the psychic the third time. So this time, he gave her an peachwood comb and asked her to open up the ceiling from the kitchen to living room. Then placed the comb wrapped in red cloth inside the cavity. She thought of us immediately since we had helped her decorate, and that's how she ended up visiting our office that day. Hmm. Hearing all this, my curiosity was piqued. I called over the receptionist and discreetly told her to call the designer and the manager who worked on this woman's home. I figured we should at least see the actual situation before deciding anything. Just as I expected. This house has indeed a story. As soon as I mentioned the house, they all started complaining over the phone, gave me an earful about what a hassle it would be and how annoying it was. But this was part of our service, so they had to come whether they like it or not. Thirty minutes later, we all met up at the housing complex entrance, and there were four of us heading up: the designer, the project manager, the assistant, and myself. The woman didn't join us as she went to visit another psychic and had just given us the keys. If I had thought of haunted houses as just symbolic in movies before, my entire perspective was flipped upside down at that moment. I can't remember exactly which floor, maybe eighth or ninth. It's a pretty ordinary flat layout with three units per level. Hers was in the middle. We got in, slipped on shoe covers, and headed inside. The layout was great. Living room position, lighting, ventilation, all excellent. Sunshine poured in through the windows. If this was my place, I'd be melting without AC on a day like this. But somehow, this sunny room in the dead of summer summoned nothing but piercing cold and gloom. Now this is my second reminder that it was the hottest time in the hottest day in summer. The temperature had just more than 33 degrees Celsius. Even standing in the hallway and in the elevator was just a sweaty work. But the instant I stepped inside the unit, goosebumps covered my whole body. It was sheer bone-chilling cold, terrifyingly cold. Acting professionally, I took a quick walk through each room to survey the structure while the designer and assistant measured the ceiling. The project manager was checking the plumbing valves. The 120 square meters room only took us several minutes to inspect. We worked in complete silence tacitly, and we left just as quietly, removing our shoe covers at the door. The whole visit only took 10 minutes. It seemed that we all felt something was wrong at this house. On the way back. The designer told us more details about the house I hadn't known. Around 2004, when the company had just started up, the boss landed projects mainly through connections. One client was a local prominent family who needed a place for their child to live while attending school nearby. So the father purchased an apartment and had the mother and child settle there. He hired our company for a luxury renovation and made that clear upfront. The boss didn't dare cut corners and personally oversaw the quality himself. It took six months to complete and spent twenty thousand dollars, which was a huge undertaking in the year of two thousand and five. They finished it successfully, and this was the first time. Fast forward three years to two thousand and seven, when this designer I'm talking about had just joined our firm. One day, a woman in her thirty came in, and she happened to meet with her. 
They discussed design concepts briefly before the woman drove them over to the house. When they got to the apartment, she was surprised to find it was fully furnished and renovated, clearly down to high standards. But her first words were, "Get rid of everything here. I don't want any of it. Rip out even the wallpaper. You can take all the furniture if you want." The site survey and discussions went smoothly. On the drive back, she gave him a $500 renovation deposit and asked him to start drafting plans. The designer thought it seemed like such a waste to tear up this perfectly nice home. So when he talked to the service manager back at the office, he mentioned this strange request. Now the manager was also an old company veteran who was familiar with that first unit job three years ago. A light bulb went off in his head. Could this be the same one the boss handed himself? When they went for the second site visit, the manager came along too, and sure enough, it was the exact same unit, just a different owner now. That woman is not the client's first wife. They reported this discovery to the boss afterwards, but the boss didn't say much about it. After all, they couldn't refuse to renovate the place just because it was previously their own project with a different owner. Same quality and punctuality expected as always. Everything went smoothly. Six months later, that woman moved in, and this was only the second time. Three years passed, and it was 2010. One day, a woman came to the company, also in her 30s. With professional dress and hair. Yup, she is a woman from our story beginning who I met with that hot summer day. Coincidentally, she requested the same designer who had worked on the second renovation. They met and asked to survey a used apartment she wanted to redone. The designer didn't think anything of it then, and they drove over together. But the more they drove, the more familiar the road became. Suddenly, she realized with sinking dread that they were heading towards the exact same unit yet again. And like the previous woman, her demands mirrored those of the previous woman three years ago. Total redo, everything stripped out and replaced. With great reluctance, she had no choice but to start from scratch yet again. Though her mind overflowed with millions of unanswered questions, returning to the office, he sat down with the boss again and recounted the whole story. Now it was the boss' turn to be confused. What on earth was going on with this place? No one could make sense of it. About six months later, after finishing the renovation, the designer and the client had become friends. So one night at dinner, the designer couldn't hold back anymore and blurted out all her questions out. The woman listened and ready to tell him everything. The first owner, the client's wife and child, had lived there two years with no issues. But then the wife was suddenly diagnosed with late-stage cancer and deteriorated extremely quickly. She died within six months, right in that home. The man ended up bringing their son back to his hometown. After three years, the man took on a young mistress and gave her this empty unit to live in, briefly mentioning it was his ex-wife's prior home. She's the one who hired our company the second time to renovate. She didn't have any kids and lived in there alone, but seemed happy. Then, in the final year, disaster struck. The woman vanished without a trace. Yes, vanished, gone. No one knows where or how. Dead, ran away, kidnapped. A living person just disappeared into thin air. Then the unit just sat vacant until the current woman acquired it. She was the client's lover. They didn't get married, but this woman had gave birth to a son, on top of the daughter she already had. Needing to move them to the city for the kids' schooling. But feeling the place had karma from the previous two occupants, she requested the same total renovation. And somehow, possibly we are the largest and most reputable decor firm in the town. It was our company that got the job all three times. As the designer said herself with a sign, the three-year curse started again. After that, I quit the job at 2011 and never went back. And haven't heard any updates of that story. It's now the third year again in 2014, so I hope that woman and her children will be safe. By then, everything seemed settled until a shocking comment posted on April 10th, 2014. I'm a resident in the next building unit. They must have been on the eighth floor because I heard the unit there had an incident recently. Anyway, those are the creepy tales I've got to share with you all today. Hope you find them more thrilling than chilling. If any of you have your own frightening experiences or local legends you want to share with us, hit me up. I'm always down for more ghost stories. Okay, catch you next time.